All right, everybody. Well, thank you so much for joining us uh, for our webinar. The focus for this webinar is going to be um, our methods for managing equipment access, which really is what probably the backbone of our system is uh, managing equipment access and also managing how long a person can have a piece of equipment. Now, as far as our outline and what we're going to be discussing today, we're going to start out with uh, a little bit about us. So where did web checkout come from? You know, a little bit of information about our customers. We're also going to discuss our focus on asset management and asset control, which is really important. Asset control is a part that separates us. And I think the bulk of this webinar is going to be dedicated to the various ways that, that we control uh, who can access what, and that's going to be through certifications, groups, and patron classes. Now, like I said, a little bit about us. Uh, most of you, um, I, your names are familiar, so I think we've had conversations before, uh, but you probably know Web Checkout has been around for a very long time. We're a tenured software company, 22 years old now. And our biggest support is offered to higher education. We have been thankful the last few years, actually we've begun venturing into production sectors as well. And I think this is because so many students and um, and professors have used us in film and broadcast schools and actually have taken us into the production and broadcast sector. Anyways, uh, 22 years old, we're primarily focused on higher ed. And another unique part about us is that we're a very small team. I think there's only 13 of us here. That's the way we kind of like it. And that helps us to become much more focused on our customers and to provide a certain level of customer service that's unique to our company. Now, since, uh, since we were started, we have grown to over 400 higher education customers worldwide, uh, something that we're very, very proud of. And our roots actually started at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. So a couple decades ago, uh, a developer was invited to go there to develop a unique software solution. Uh, it was asset management combined with asset control, which was very unique for the time. There were a lot of asset management solutions at that time, but SAIC needed something that could control what students could and couldn't do with equipment, which was ex extremely important if you have somebody who's 20 years old and they're using a $4,000 camera. And so after building the software, that's how we became a little more contagious and began growing throughout higher education. So this is what we specialize in. We're the most granular access uh, mechanism for, um, for equipment access in the industry. So there are some obvious benefits for why you should control what your equipment can and can't do and who has access, but let's go through some of these. Uh, some of these may have not been thought of. For one, obviously extending the life of your equipment. If you have an asset that's used by a person who knows how to use it, it is less likely to get damaged and that's going to be important for you. Um, we also want to make sure if an expert has a piece of equipment, we want to make sure that they always have access to that piece of equipment. So you're increasing your availability of the right equipment for people. There's no reason for a first year biology student to have access to a, a high end photography, uh, a high end camera. Uh, also, our system is going to reduce the risk of human error for student workers. So what I mean by this is um, <clears throat> there are, in my experience, I've seen a whole lot of schools who have kind of manually tried to create these processes. So manually dictate who has access to what equipment. Ours is, is much more automated. So we really want to ensure that if you're in a particular uh, film class, you really only can have certain pieces of equipment. Uh, but we're not so restricted that you can't override that. So if you want to uh, loan a piece of equipment to somebody who doesn't meet these, uh, these authorizations, you can. That information is just saved and tracked within our system. And also kind of less, less of a use case, but probably the most important, there is a reduction in risk to students when you restrict what kind of equipment that they can use. And I'm thinking more physical risk. 
where I see this at is in wood shops and engineering schools. There's a lot of equipment. I'm thinking table saws, I'm thinking welding kits that you really do need training on that equipment before you use it. So part of the automation of this is to make sure that your students are protected, but also to make sure that the school itself has a reduction in liability. And lastly, there, there's some advertising benefits. I'll discuss that use case a little more in just a moment. I'll kind of demo what, what I'm talking about here. So our first function and probably the biggest function is going to be groups. So groups are the way we can control who has access to what. And groups tend to be tied to class enrollment. So if you, I keep picking on photography, but if you have a photography class, you can make it to where that photography class is the only class that has access to a high-end red camera. Now, this function's a little unique because um, this will sound like I'm changing the subject, but when your students want to access equipment to make reservations within, uh, within our system, they'll use a system called Patron Portal. That's our mobile reservation solution. And the equipment that you see in Patron Portal is completely governed by what groups you're in. So you can only see equipment that, uh, that deals with the groups that you're actually located in. And I'll show you that in just a moment. Now, some of the examples, other examples people can use for groups, again, it could be tied to class enrollment. Uh, another thing that uh, some schools do is they'll create groups based on freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors. And really with groups, you can, um, you can kind of use your imagination if you want to think of, if you have an unusual use case, you can create groups based on that use case. And you can also, um, you can completely automate this process to where these groups are updated on a nightly basis. So I think an example would be Carolyn, who's in this meeting right now. If she drops out of your film class, uh, she's going to be unable to access some of that high-end film equipment that she could previously. Now, what I'm going to do is give you a quick example of how groups actually works. So <clears throat> to give you an idea of what you're looking at here, both of these screens right here, this is Patron Portal. So this would be our mobile reservation solution. And I have two editions of Patron Portal. Uh, the reason the screens look a little weird is this is how it would look on an iPad if a student was going to make a reservation. So for groups, what I wanna show you is what happens if Carolyn and I try to make a reservation of a camera. So if I go to Patron Portal and I click on cameras, I have access to a Canon camera, a RED camera, so a high-end camera, and a Sony camera. But if Carolyn goes to the camera section, she only has access to a Canon camera and a Sony camera. And that's because she's not in the correct group for the red camera. So she must not be enrolled in the exact same classes that I am. And that's how groups would work in, in your version of web checkout. Now, a different side of this would be, let me pull back up my screen, would be certifications. So certifications, this is a, this is much more granular. We're, we're going with a more sophisticated use cases here. Groups dealt with uh, kind of limiting access to maybe a whole classroom of students. Certifications are assigned to one student in particular. And the idea here is that a student has passed some kind of examination or maybe a proficiency course to use a potentially really expensive piece of equipment or a delicate piece of equipment or even a piece of equipment that could be more dangerous. Uh, certifications are unique because you can, you can save whatever test that a student has taken. You can save it to their user profile and you can even, you can make certifications expire. So if you want someone to only be certified for three months after three months are, uh, is completed, uh, that student would be unable to access the equipment. They would have to become recertified. So some of the use cases that we see for, uh, for certifications, a lot of our uh, photography departments 
will require certifications to use dark rooms and very high end pieces of equipment. Uh, I mean, just because you join a photography class does not know that it does not mean that you know how to use a dark room. So they want an extra layer of access to make sure that you know what you're doing there. Um, another example would be what I mentioned before uh, for wood shops, for engineering departments, uh, those pieces of equipment that could be potentially dangerous for students. Certifications work very well for that. And also for students who actually drive campus vehicles. We see this in film schools, sometimes in IT, where a van is loaded up with a lot of high-end equipment. Um, if students are going to drive that van, you may want to have them certified. You don't want to put them in a group. <clears throat> and a quick note about certifications, it's a little different than groups. With certifications, everyone can still see the equipment. So if they go into patron portal, and I'll show this to you in a minute, everyone can still see this piece of equipment. You just, you can't actually reserve it. So it's more like advertising, if you will. It'll show the cool piece of equipment that everybody wants, but in order to use it, you can include some notes about what it is you need to pass in order to uh, uh, claim this very, very unique item. So like I said, I'm, I'm going to pull this up and show you the difference with uh, certifications. So let's go back to Sean and Carolyn. And what I'm going to do this time, I'm actually going to book a location or a room, which is something that you can do in web checkout. So I'm going to go to mixing bays. Let's do the exact same thing with here. Go to mixing bays. Now notice we both can see it. I mean, everything looks fine. Although I did include a big fat note in here that you have to pass the mixing bay training course. And I included some information about visiting the loaner desk for more information. Well, let's say that Carolyn and I both try to reserve this space. <clears throat> well, Carolyn, if we click on our basket, a lot like Amazon, and she goes to make this reservation. She's going to be gracious and agree to our terms and conditions. She can go ahead and submit the reservation. Everything here is just fine. Me, on the other hand, I'm a slacker. So I decided not to get certified because I was lazy. And I'll agree to the terms and conditions, but if you scroll down here, I'm not certified to use this resource. So again, I'm gonna to have to read the notes, and figure out what I need to do to get my certification to use this piece of equipment in this room. It's a little bit of an idea about how certifications are going to work for everybody. And then lastly, we're gonna take a look at patron classes. So patron classes are unique. They, they actually deal a little more with our policies. So these are going to be some of the rules that you can live by um, how long a person is allowed to have a piece of equipment is an example of it. And a patron class could be, you can create as many patron classes as you want so that people can live by different rules. So an example would be if you have a student, a student may uh, only be able to reserve a laptop for two weeks, uh, but a professor on campus may be able to reserve that, that laptop for the entire semester if you want. And some examples of this would be, well, what I just said, you know, we, we've seen a lot of people divide patron classes by employees compared to the student base. We've also seen people create patron classes based on, on freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors. Internationally, we've seen customers classify patron classes uh, quarterly, semesterly, or even trimester. And, and also, it, Inside film schools and even actually in the film world, some people will create patron classes for producers, groups, um, and, and production assistants alike. So I'll give you an example again of how this is going to look. We're actually going to switch from the student interface on an iPad to your interface this time, which is the um, web checkouts primary administrative page. And I'll go ahead and note, since I'm here, this is the front page of the administrative system. This is what you would see all the time. 
And we have a dashboard up front that shows you your orders that you need to prepare for, the orders that are going to be returning. And also we have some quick reservation and quick checkout functions to where you can just scan a student's ID card and scan a piece of equipment and deploy it very, very quickly. Now I'm digressing a bit. Let's go ahead and go to our checkout centers and we will take a look at patron classes and how they work. So for this system, <clears throat> my patron classes are actually dedicated to clients, interns, independent contractors, and employees. Again, you can change these to anything you want. So let's say we're going to create, we want to create a patron class for interns. And since this person is an intern, and they're going to be checking out laptops, we really only want them to, um, shoot, let's say they can only check out a laptop for eight hours. We're a little cautious at this point. We don't want them to have it for much longer. Who can blame you? But let's say we want different rules for an employee, maybe a tenured employee. A tenured employee could reserve the exact same laptop for 12 weeks. So again, this is an example of how we can create different rules for different people in this system. Now I'm going to revert on back over to my PowerPoint. And these are the basics that I want to go over today. I mean, it's, again, it's the backbone of our system, but it's how we grant access to different types of people. And then also how we can control um, the duration of those access depending on groups, certifications, and patron classes. So uh, I do want to go ahead and open this up for questions. Um, let's see, we're reading our notes right now. Carolyn, do, do we have any questions in the hopper at this time? Hey, Sean, uh, thanks for that great um, demonstration. I think you did a really nice job of uh, giving us an idea of what the differences are between groups and patron classes and certifications. Um, I think while we're waiting to see if anyone has any other questions, one that I know comes up a lot for us is, um, you know, does this change if you're working with different departments on your campus that have web checkout or are these controls um, customizable to specific departments? Uh, okay, yeah, and that's, that's a good point. It's worth some note. So web, web checkout's an enterprise system, meaning it's meant to be deployed across the entire campus. Uh, but at the same time, it's, it's separated, or I've heard some people call it federated. It's federated into different, uh, different inventories. So maybe an example would explain this better. Uh, you can have an IT department that has a, a laptop loaner program. Their inventory is unique. It's separate. They have their own groups, certifications, and patron classes. Then you, you could have a film school across campus. And they're using web checkout too, but their inventory is completely separate. You know, you really can't even tell that they're they're connected in any way that you know they would be within uh, within the same instance. And uh, that film school could have their very own uh, groups, certifications, and patron classes. Uh, the nice part about this is all of these uh, all these checkout centers they're still under the same instance. So some of the things that you can do. Um, if a, let's say a student in that film school actually got angry and destroyed one of your pieces of equipment, well, if they go to IT and they try to get a laptop, IT can still actually get a note saying, hey, something happened at one of our checkout centers and you need to be careful here. So the system will still let your departments communicate a little bit, but otherwise it's going to be as if you have your very own system of web checkout for each department. So yeah, thanks for bringing that up, Carolyn. Um, have you seen anything else come up, uh, question-wise? I think we don't have any other questions on the line, so I think we can go ahead and wrap up for today. All right, well, perfect. Well, again, thanks for, uh, thank you for joining us. I know everybody is busy as sin right now. Um, you can see the notes, but if you have questions, especially if they're completely unrelated to this webinar, always feel free to call me. Um, I love learning about new use cases. It's almost a challenge for me. I wanna see if you can bring up something that we haven't heard of. Maybe we can find a way to do it. So please feel free to reach 
out to me, an uh, email, or that's even my personal cell phone number. Otherwise, we wish you the best of luck with the fall semester.